This chilling footage shows a man carrying what seems to be an axe. He is 42-year-old retired U.S. Marine Ewan DeWitt. Minutes later, a frantic call made to the Milford Police Department by a 17-year-old reported that his mother was being assaulted by a man in their home, the same man spotted on camera. What was the connection between Ewan and this woman that led to this shocking incident? What could drive a former Marine to such violence? Join us as we uncover the disturbing story of Julie Minogue. Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest condolences to the loved ones of Julie Minogue, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. Julie Minogue was born on July the 19th, 1982, in Goshen, New York, the daughter of Gerald Minogue and Sandra Barash Doper. She had two siblings, Allison Barati Corcoran and Peter Gerald Minogue, with Julie being the youngest. She graduated from the Monroe Woodbury High School and then attended Orange County Community College. With her professional life ahead of her, she moved to Milford, Connecticut and began working as a medical assistant with the Coastal Obstetrics and Gynecology. In Julie's personal life, she was a good, caring mother to three boys, Nicholas, Sean, and Luke. For most of the boys' lives, she had been a single parent. Nicholas was the oldest at 21 and was serving in the U.S. Coast Guard. Sean, at 17, was still in high school, and the baby boy was Luke at the age of three. Nicholas and Sean were Julie's children from a previous relationship. Luke came along after Julie had a relationship with a man named Ewan A. Dewitt of Roxbury, Connecticut, whom she'd met in 2017. A relationship that was doomed from the beginning. On November 9th, 2019, Dewitt was arrested for assaulting Julie by throwing a playpen at her head while she was holding their infant son. The charges were second-degree assault and risk of injury to an infant. Both were felonies. The six-week-old was not harmed, but Julie sustained a concussion and required staples for the gash the playpen left on her head. DeWitt was also charged with misdemeanor third-degree criminal mischief and disorderly conduct. He destroyed Julie's phone so she couldn't call 911, and she had to flee to a neighbor's residence to make the call. DeWitt was accused of being drunk when the disturbance occurred. In the months that followed, he would go through alcohol treatment and a treatment program for veterans who had used violence in relationships. A protective order was also issued to DeWitt, who pleaded not guilty and was released on a $20,000 bond. Julie left DeWitt in 2021 and moved herself and the children into a condominium in Milford, Connecticut. She also filed for child support in August of 2021, and in October 2021, DeWitt was ordered to pay. Then, in December of that same year, DeWitt took Julie to court over visitation. Julie's attorney filed an objection because of the pending assault case, and there had been a new arrest in North Carolina for DeWitt. This was for allegedly assaulting a female along with emergency personnel. DeWitt had also been allegedly harassing staff at his son's daycare. Records show that an agreement was reached on supervised visitation for DeWitt. He would have visitation every other Saturday for two hours only, and this would be in a public place at Eisenhower Park. Sadly, in many family cases, a parent is pressured to give access to the abuser that they're afraid of, so Julie could not escape the order. I don't feel I should be subjected to this abuse any longer, Julie wrote in a November 17th affidavit, the Connecticut Post reported. I'm scared for the safety of my children and myself. Ewan has gotten himself into a lot of trouble with drugs and alcohol, and I'm scared he's going to kill me. On November the 14th of 2022, Julie told the Milford police that her ex-boyfriend, Ewan DeWitt, had violated a protective order. He had sent her over 220 harassing texts. On November the 17th, 2022, a judge granted a temporary civil restraining order against DeWitt. Then, on November the 21st of that year, the police submitted an arrest warrant application. 
Officer Scott Nablin of the Milford Police Department handled the paperwork for the warrant. It would go to the state attorney for the violation of the protective order. The application was denied and sent back with a request for more information, thus causing a delay in the warrant being served. Instead of more information being collected, the warrant application was not resubmitted and it was never signed. On December 1st of 2022, on a separate issue, a judge granted an extension to the restraining order from November the 14th. Then, on December 6th, 2022, at around 9 p.m., a call came in to 911 requesting immediate help at 76 Salem Walk in Milford, Connecticut. The caller was 17-year-old Sean Minogue. He had awakened to screams coming from downstairs. Sean told 911 that DeWitt, her mother's ex-boyfriend, was holding an axe and his mother was on the floor in the kitchen covered in blood. A ring camera provided by a neighbor shows a man walking with an axe in his hand, matching the description of DeWitt. Ben and Jen, the victim, 40-year-old Julie Minogue, lived in those condos behind me. Police say the suspect, 42-year-old Ewan DeWitt, was somehow able to get inside her home with an axe, allegedly killing her while both of her children were inside the home. Sean had told 911 that he had run back upstairs, locked the door, and called for help. He then jumped out of his bedroom window to meet with the police when they arrived. When police officers entered the home, they found a large axe on top of the stove with evidence on the blade and Julie's body on the floor in a large pool of blood. She was suffering from fatal injuries, was not moving, and appeared to not be breathing. It would later be determined by the medical examiner that the cause of death was from hacking wounds and blunt impacts to the head, torso, and extremities. Authorities would rule it as a homicide. Julie's three-year-old son was on the couch, in shock and not moving. Both sons had been witnesses to the brutal attack on their mother. Julie Minogue was just 40 years old at the time of her death. Ewan DeWitt was nowhere to be found. DeWitt fled the scene, so officers began canvassing the neighborhood and surrounding areas. Soon after, the mother of DeWitt called 911 to report that her son had called her and had admitted that he had just killed his girlfriend. Mrs. DeWitt said her son wanted to kill himself. She gave the officers his cell phone number, which they proceeded to call in an attempt to make contact with him, but he refused to talk and just hung up. It was unclear how the officers received the following information, but they headed towards a place called Dive Bar on Ocean Avenue in West Haven, where DeWitt had been spotted. The bar was less than a mile from Julie's home. Police were flagged down by two individuals who recognized DeWitt wandering around in the parking lot of the dive bar. He was last seen entering a food truck parked at a bakery on Ocean Avenue. Officers entered the truck found DeWitt and took him into custody. The owner of the property was shocked that DeWitt was found inside her food truck, but she was glad that he had been caught and arrested. Had you not tell me, I would not know. Uh, unless now I'm going to go on my cameras and see it for myself. Louise was dumbfounded to learn last night police found accused killer Ewan DeWitt hiding in the food truck outside her bakery and restaurant. And of, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what to say, but to even think that the gentleman was in the trailer, I mean, I don't know. It's very sad, very sad, very sad that something like that has happened. I didn't even know there was a murder yesterday, and that's a tragedy. Just happy that they caught him, and I feel very bad for the family. Ewan DeWitt, age 42, was charged with murder, violation of a protective order, violation of a restraining order, risk of injury to a child, and reckless endangerment. Here was DeWitt, charged with the murder of the mother of his three-year-old son, the same man who had previously been arrested for assaulting her. The same man recently harassing Julie and she in turn begging for help from officials. All of this just weeks prior to her murder. The attorneys on both sides cited mental health concerns with DeWitt. 
His history showed that he had served in the Marine Corps from 2009 until 2013. He was a veteran, and there had been some mental health issues possibly caused by his time in the military. During his arraignment, DeWitt gave a full admission to officers of what had occurred. At the request of DeWitt's attorney, he was placed on suicide watch while being held on a $5 million bond. Keeping the innocent safe is difficult because many offenders disregard the protective orders. No imaginary line will keep them from what they are after, regardless of the consequences to themselves. Things had gone terribly wrong. Officer Scott Nablin with the Milford Police Department submitted the initial warrant application on DeWitt to the Asonia Milford State's Attorney's Office. It was reviewed by a prosecutor and returned that day with a request for more information. The warrant itself was not resubmitted until December 13th, just a week after Minogue's murder. There was an investigation into the reason why this was not done as soon as possible. It is common for prosecutors to send back applications for more information. They just want a strong case, not just a probable cause. Thus, the warrant application went back to Officer Nablin to gather more information, but it was not followed through upon. The ball was dropped. The officer was put on leave while an internal investigation was done. This tragedy, this domestic violence case, questions the safeguards needed in the process of obtaining a warrant because it is often considered imminent danger. Thus, it may need to be handled quickly. After Julie's death, a different officer refiled the warrant for the arrest of DeWitt, of which he would be served additional charges for the violations in jail. A man accused of killing his ex-girlfriend with an axe is now facing more charges involving the victim. Today, Ewan DeWitt was served with a new arrest warrant for harassment and a violation of a protective order. It stems from a complaint that Julie Minogue made to Milford police before her murder when DeWitt allegedly sent her 220 text messages. According to the warrant, which News 12 obtained, some of the text messages from you and DeWitt to the victim were derogatory in nature. It says some of the text messages from the victim to you and DeWitt indicated that the victim did not want you and DeWitt to text message her and to leave her alone forever. Police initially submitted an arrest warrant for DeWitt to the court last month, but it was returned to police with a request for more information. For unknown reasons, it was not resubmitted before Minogue's murder December 6th. And this morning, DeWitt made his first in-person court appearance in the murder case. He kept his head down as he stood next to his public defender. He'll be back in court on all the charges February 3rd. A vigil in Minogue's memory on Sunday drew hundreds of people, including the lieutenant governor. Clearly, we need to do more, and we need to get the community involved in trying to identify situations that are dangerous so that we can keep people safe. According to the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Minogue's death is the 11th from intimate partner violence in the state this year. Last year, there were 16. Officer Scott Nablin of the Milford PD was placed on leave for nine months during the internal investigation, but he eventually resigned in July of 2023 following that investigation. This would be done from the connection with his inaction on the warrant application and the subsequent death of Julie Minogue in December of 2022. Julie had gone to the police with her newest concern and had made that complaint to Officer Nablin. She told the officer that DeWitt had broken the protective order against him. She had pleaded for help, and she put her trust into the legal system's hands. Two weeks later, Julie was murdered. Gerald Minogue says his daughter Julie did everything right in alerting the authorities and filing the proper paperwork in order to try and protect herself and her children from a dangerous situation. When I got there, they told me she was dead. Then I heard the brutal details of it, Gerald said. I can't even fathom another human being doing that to another. I mean, that's barbaric. According to the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Connecticut sees 14 intimate partner murders every year. But the lethality of the murders and how they are carried out have become even more extreme. Michael Rosnick, the attorney representing the Minogue family, filed a letter of intent that named the city of Milford, 
the police department, and Officer Nablin concerning impending litigation. The letter stated that Julie's death was preventable and the family would be seeking multiple damages. Mr. DeWitt had a long history of violent behavior against Miss Minogue and others, Resnick wrote, contending this was known or should have been known by the proposed defendants. Rosnick contends that the proposed defendants failed to take threats against Minogue's life seriously and act to protect her in a timely and appropriate fashion. So this is this is just horrific. And I usually try to understand sort of both sides of the coin in these issues, but I'm really having a hard time here. He also had assault charges that were pending from 2019 from two separate incidences. The first was assaulting a female paramedic, and then the second was actually assaulting her. And those should not have still been pending. And that that's what's surprising to me is I'm surprised that in four years, even with COVID, those charges were, were still pending. I think with the totality of the circumstances, the assault charges, the copious amounts of phone calls, the, the clear amount of stalking that he was engaging in, um, an arrest warrant should have been issued for him. And I do feel um, that the judge was in the wrong here, actually not issuing one, and her death could have been prevented because of that. Meanwhile, DeWitt has changed his plea to not guilty on all charges. Hundreds gathered at a vigil honoring Julie Minogue, who was killed just five days earlier in her home. Those who knew her described her as someone who lit up a room whenever she was in the presence of others. But when she was at her brightest, she was talking about her great love, her children. She was a happy, positive force in their lives, and she was an amazing, protective, and loving mother. Julie also cared deeply for her friends, her co-workers, and her patients. She was just that type of person, and she wanted them to know that they were important and loved. The closest people to Julie knew about her ongoing domestic problems, and they had worried about her, but they had been shocked by the end result of this constant problem. They were angry at the senseless death of this woman, but they came together during the vigil to grieve and to support the family and hopefully to heal. Julie's sister had even set up a GoFundMe account for the three boys that raised over $100,000 that Sunday afternoon at the vigil. People were raw from the feelings they had after Julie's death, and they needed to turn those feelings into something positive, and they did so by turning it into a positive fight against domestic violence. That violence is not going away on its own. It affects millions of people worldwide. There needs to be an increased awareness, knowledge, and education, along with help for the victims. Over 10 million people are affected by domestic violence each year in the U.S. An average of 24 people per minute are victims of sexual assault, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner, totaling over 12 million men and women annually. Nearly 3 in 10 women, 29%, and 1 in 10 men, 10%, have experienced sexual violence physical violence, and or stalking by a partner. One in four women and one in seven men aged 18 and older have been victims of severe physical violence by an intimate partner. Julie's family has filed a lawsuit against Milford and its police department for mishandling her numerous requests for help during her time with you and DeWitt. Damages sought would include any medical expenses, pain and suffering, and loss of affection. Because of their failure to take the appropriate action that was needed to prevent Julie's death, Ewan DeWitt had previous charges from North Carolina in an assault on a female and the assault of Julie, yet both were still pending. If he had been served and placed behind bars, Julie might be alive today. Everything she did, she did for her kid. My daughter, I should say, encountered, you know, evil, okay? A, a monster, as I'll call it. DeWitt also never obeyed any of the paperwork that was filed against him regarding the protective order or the domestic violence order. Tragedy, uh, you know, should ever come close to uh, what we're, we're encounter what we're, we've encountered with my daughter. Julie's death was preventable, and there was too much history with DeWitt for them not to see that. 
It's imperative for the legal system to perform their duties. The system had failed Julie Minogue miserably. Julie did what she did to keep herself and her children safe, yet she was murdered in her own home by her ex-boyfriend and the father of her youngest child. So, did the system fail her? The system, of course, isn't perfect, but the laws and legal systems that are in place do need some tweaking. Abusers will do anything to get around the laws just to get to their victim. They will take the victim to court to gain visitation or custody of the child or children, which means they only use the child to gain access to their victim. With a legislative session on the horizon, the General Assembly's Judiciary Committee plans to tackle this and other issues, including the possible expansion of the state's GPS monitoring program for domestic violence offenders, but also the hot-button issue of bail reform. Bail bondsmen will um, compete with each other, um, with the accused, as far as how much actual cash they have to put down. So, and then they'll give them a loan for the other portion. That's just one aspect of um, bail reform that I think needs to be dealt with almost immediately. While Democrat May Flexer told Fox 61 it's more of a communication gap issue with different agencies not being easily able to access an offender's records to inform a proper bail amount. When either our court system or law enforcement agencies are interacting with individuals who have a history of domestic violence, they need to know about that. And that needs to be thoroughly documented on all the records. That isn't the case right now. Domestic violence service organizations for their role tell Fox 61 that the crime of domestic abuse can't be viewed in a silo. A lot of the domestic violence that happens and the people that cause harm are also have warrants, are also have crimes outside of their domestic violence. The GPS alert system can be used where high-risk offenders run a high probability of violating protective or restraining orders. They would be assigned a GPS monitor that would help them keep track of where the offender is. This would be for the victim, judicial, and law enforcement to know the location of an offender at any time. If the offender is coming close to violating the protective orders, action can be taken quickly. Lawyers for DeWitt are hopeful that a mental health report will keep their client in his defense. In his initial statement at the time of arrest, DeWitt had admitted his involvement in the crime, but he has since retracted that, and the state does have plenty of evidence plus his initial admission. There was also a motion approved by a judge for collecting DNA from DeWitt that could tie him to the murder of Julie Minogue as well. The prosecution is looking for DeWitt's DNA match to be found on the acts used in the murder. No further updates as of December of 2023 on the Ewan DeWitt trial have been made public at this time, though he does still remain in custody. Once a woman seeks a protective order, it becomes the deadliest time in that relationship, according to Michelle Voigt with the Violent Crime Survivors Organization. 20% of domestic violence murder victims had protective orders in place. A new legislative regulation was adopted on March the 22nd, 2023 in the National Assembly, which will introduce electronic GPS bracelets so that the perpetrators of domestic violence can be monitored. This is in the hope that it will give the victim more peace of mind, plus the abusive person can be tracked. But more needs to be done for anyone that is a victim of domestic violence. A piece of paper, for many, will not stop their abuser. Stricter laws, punishments, and safeguards need to be developed. Even those that follow the instructions of the law, as Julie did, each individual needs to create a safety plan for themselves. Do not continue to be a victim of abuse. Julie Minogue did not deserve this. No one does. But maybe her story will help open someone's eyes. May it help someone to make that tough decision. May it help to save a life. Whether the abuse is against a woman, man, child, or animal, the abuse has to stop. Don't wait. Domestic violence is never okay. If you or someone you know is experiencing abuse, seek help. 
Call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Together, we can stop the cycle of violence. If you found this message helpful, share it to spread awareness and support those in need. Together, we can make a difference. If you find this video compelling, you might want to watch these other similar videos.